Right, so thank you everyone for, this, for, coming, for coming to the session. Uh, I'm Paul Stoll, we're a bit packed. And you're all fed and watered after lunch. Our first talk in this session is going to be managing data quest concurrency with, with Django, with David Seddon. Uh, David will be taking a few questions at the end of the session, so we'll come to that again. But in the meantime, please join me welcome David. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So, um, yeah, my name is David. Uh, I'm one of the organisers of the London Django Meetup, along with Adam and some other people. Um, I also work at Growth Street. We are a fintech startup based in London. We're hiring senior Python developers. So, if you're interested in giving small businesses the tools to grow, then uh, come and find me afterwards. Um, so, before I start, can I just get a show of hands? Who here builds things with Django? Ooh. Um, and who here uses, I mean, uh, probably going to be similar, but who here uses databases? <laughs> okay, so uh, actually there isn't that much about Django in this talk. It's mainly about databases. Um, there is one slide on Django. That's all you need to know, really. Um, uh, it's quite easy to do what I'm going to show you with Django. Um, so um, first of all, I'm going to ask a question to see how people think about concurrency. So, um, what do I mean by concurrency? Well, what I mean is a database, a relational database, uh, can have multiple connections to it at once. Um, I didn't actually realize this really for a long time. But um, uh, you can have multiple processes reading and changing the data actually at the same time. Um, and my question to you is, how do your, how does the software that you build handle that? So, four choices. Uh, and if you probably, some of you manage multiple pieces of software, you can put your hand up twice if you like. So, uh, the first, first option is, um, how does your software handle database concurrency? Well, the database does it automatically. Don't need to think about it. Great. Yeah, great. Uh, B, I wrote code to handle it. Specific code, okay, a few less. Uh, C, it's not really applicable, there is no concurrency in my data. Oh, it might be lost now. Okay, good, we all agree there's concurrency. Um, and D, I have no idea how many tools that before. To be really honest. Um, I really didn't, maybe I was D, maybe I was A for a long time as a Django developer. Uh, I think it's something that maybe we don't think about that much, or we just assume that it's going to work. And most of the time it does. Um, but I'm going to tell you a cautionary tale, uh, and I hope that at the end of this talk you will agree with me that database concurrency, current currency is something you need to think about in some sense. So this is Darren Sedwerb. He's a developer at Bankity Bank. Um, <laughs> no relation. <laughs> um, and he's a really good developer, but he doesn't really understand concurrency. Um, that's, the, that's his only flaw. And uh, he um, wrote this code, which you probably won't be able to read um, in that respect, but it doesn't really matter. All this code does is, this is the function which allows customers to withdraw money from their bank accounts. Now, he was like, well, what does that really need to do? First of all, it needs to check that they've got that money in their bank account, and then it needs to minus that money from their bank account and send it out. Simple. So all this code does is it says, if the account has at least that money, then reduce the balance by that amount and then send the money out. All seems fine, all seems logical. The problem is, is that when he released it, this happened. He was horrified. The account balance of some of the customers went into the negative. They had overdrafts when that really wasn't part of the bank, bank's model. Um, so so uh, he was to blame. Now, can anyone tell me why? Yes. Because you stored the balance as a number in the database. Uh, well, uh, so let's assume that um, the balance stuff is kind of, the storage of the balance is implemented OK. It's to do specifically with checking the balance and then reducing it. There's a race condition. Yes. So. The same funds as a result of the between check and removal. Exactly. So, um, what's going on here? Let's say uh, there were two processes. 
uh, there was there was a customer that was trying to withdraw hundred pounds and fifty pounds at the same time, and they only had hundred pounds in their account. So um, we can imagine the first worker comes in and it checks the balance. Is the balance enough? Is there hundred pounds available? Yes. And then just before it's about to take it out, the other worker comes in and it checks the balance. Is there enough money? Yes, there is. And then they both reduce the balance. One by 100, one by 50. We have minus 50, and they've gone overdrawn. And I mean, this is even assuming that this whole thing is being designed so that it doesn't overwrite the uh, value of the balance. Um, so we can see that some apparently an innocuous, sensible code can break if you don't think about concurrency in some situations. Um, and if you were doing this kind of thing in Django um, with uh, <coughs> multiple uh, workers, multiple salary workers, uh, you could quite easily get this if someone did two things in quick succession. So, how do we sort this kind of thing out? Um, so what I'm going to tell you about is we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into how databases handle concurrency. And the first thing you need to know is the database isolation level. Uh, so this is something I, I, to be honest, hadn't really encountered uh, before I started thinking about this. Um, the isolation level of the database is a kind of global setting on the database, and it specifies its strategy for dealing with concurrency. So um, you have, at one extreme, you have serialized. And this, this setting basically says, I'm really strict, I'm going to make sure my data is really accurate, but at the expense of speed. And this is quite an extreme setting. It wouldn't be a default setting. Well, it certainly isn't a default setting on Postgres. Um, at the other extreme, you've got read uncommitted, which is really quick, but it's also not that accurate. Uh, so in the middle, you've got these other two isolation levels, repeatable read and read committed. And these are pretty similar, um, and they're kind of like a mixed approach. Um, read committed is the Postgres default. That's what I'm going to focus on for this talk, but I believe that everything I say will be true for repeatable read as well. Um, maybe Adam can correct me, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Um, uh, so, read committed, how does it work? So in order to understand and think about an isolation level of the database, you need to think about two things. You need to think about how it handles reads, and you need to think about how it handles writes. So, reads. This is going to be a bit interactive. Um, so, uh, probably most of you know this, but um, a database transaction is a way of grouping separate database queries together. So you could have a read and a, a write and loads of things, and you can pack them all into a transaction. Um, by default, Django doesn't do that. It just sends off lots of queries. But you can uh, say, all right, I want to open a transaction. Here's a query. Here's another query. Here's 50 queries. Then I'm going to commit the transaction. And at that point, it gets sort of finally committed to the database. So th this is a really important concept. Um, uh, so that's the first thing you need to know. So here we are, reading. This is a particular scenario. We've got two transactions. The first transaction is going to set the value of a row from 0 to 1. And then, later in the transaction, there's going to be some other stuff, which, let's say, takes a while. Now, after transaction A starts, transaction B is going to come in. And that's going to select the value, in other words, read it. Now, my question to you is, what happens in this situation? So, just to recap, the first transaction has set a value to 1 from 0. And then the second transaction is trying to read that value, but the first transaction hasn't yet committed. So, um, has anyone got a, a possible solution? A locked row. A locked row. A locked row. So, so how would it behave with this the block? Okay, so, so option A is when that tries to read it, it waits until this commits and then it gets the result. Yeah? So option A, let's just say it's like what it waits. Yes, at the back. 
the selecting zero. Selecting zero, that's another one. Any others? Yes, it selects one. Selects one. Any others? Two. It crashes. Well, let's say it errors. It's not more than a So, um, so uh, let's have a vote. Um, who thinks it waits? Okay, some of you. Who thinks it gets zero? Quite a lot. Who thinks it gets one? Who thinks it gets two? <laughs> who thinks it errors? Okay, well, the good news is, is that most of you got that right, but quite a lot of people didn't know, actually. Um, uh, so this is, this is how I think of it. Um, uh, so reading in the recommitted approach is that records from other sessions will become visible as they are committed. So you can't see anything until it's been committed, if, if it's from another transaction. Um, and the way I like to think about this is that within a transaction, when it sets a value in the main database, it, it kind of keeps its own little copy of it. So when, when this transaction makes subsequent queries on that row, it will get it from there instead of there. But everyone else is getting it from there. Um, uh, and then when it commits, that's when that kind of little temporary uh, database gets written in. That's just like my mental model for it. I don't exactly know how it works, to be honest. Um, so, um, well, you, you all got this one right, uh, most of you. So um, we can see that when transaction B tries to read value, it just gets zero straight away. Because it's wrong. It's wrong. Is that wrong? It, sorry? What about the one? What about the one? Well, the one goes into there, um, but it's too late. So this, this will get the older version. It will only be one once it commits. Okay, which is obviously, potentially, a bit of a problem. The other half of the situation is writing. So um, let's imagine now we've got two transactions trying to write, but otherwise it's a similar situation. So the first transaction, that writes one, or tries to, and then it does lots of other stuff. Um, transaction B comes in, and after that first write, but before it's committed, it tries to write the value. So, what are our options? Can I have an option? It was two. Anything else? One. It blocks. Okay, so, so um, uh, I'm saying uh, it, when it tries to write this, it will actually just wait. And all the rest of this stuff will happen, and then it commits. And then that commits afterwards. So it will end up being two. Uh, so it will go one, two, like that. So that's one option, it blocks. Any others? It deadlocks, it can't go forward because of this. A deadlock, so, so the whole database <coughs> like essentially gives up. Yeah. Um, okay, so deadlock. Yes? The first one could finish, the second one could um, <coughs> result in error. Okay, great. So uh, transaction one writes. So sorry, is this the first one? This uh, one? Yes, transaction A writes um, because so this, that has the first write of this error. And transaction B errors. Okay, and does it error when it tries to set it or when it commits it? <laughs> yes. B writes, then A writes, and the final value is one. B writes, then A writes. Yeah, so you're saying um, whichever gets there first commits, commits it. Um, they both commit. So it'll go two and one rather than one and two. Uh, any other options? Both transactions error. Both transactions error. Okay. Cool. So there's like there's potentially a few different ways to do it. Um, and again, this does depend on the isolation level. So we're assuming read committed. So this is how I think about it. So records sessions are writing to are marked as read only immediately. Other writers will wait until the lock is released. So the way I think about this is you can think of that as being like an extra column in a record. Um, and it's usually set to be read only null. Um, but when the transaction writes to it, it doesn't change it yet. Remember, it's keeping its, it's, keeping its little private copy. But it does change this column. So it's, it says, OK, this is, I've changed this. I'm not going to tell you what the value is yet, but I've changed it, so don't change it. And then finally, when it's committed, it will change it, and it will take the read only flag off. And so if anything else, 
tries to change something that's already marked as read only, it will wait. So, what happens in this situation? Adam was right, uh, possibly because he's already seen this talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so we have transaction A coming in. It doesn't write it, so anything else reading it would see zero. But the fact that transaction B is trying to write it means that it will check this flag and it will stop and wait. And then once it's committed, it will overwrite it with, with two. There's one final bit in your toolkit for handling in currency, which is select for update. So the way I think of select for update is it's a way of making a read query behave like a write query. In other words, obtaining that, that lock on the uh, record. So um, we've got two transactions here. They both begin with the select for update. It doesn't really matter what they do afterwards because they are both behaving like writers. In other words, they're going to wait until they've got the right to write onto it. So um, this first one comes in, it gets its flag, and then it does some stuff. And then the second one comes in, and it, it has to wait until that whole thing is committed. And now it's its turn, and it can do all this stuff. So, now you know all this, if you didn't already, how does Darren protect against concurrent withdrawals? How can we adapt his code, um, or at least the way he's interacting with the database, so that the bug that he has doesn't happen? Has anyone got any suggestions? Yes. Two. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in transaction. Yay. Okay, yes. And the people the right to be part of the same transaction. So, so um, you put in a transaction, yeah. and then the first, the first thing in that is a read. Yeah. So he's reading oh, make it read the balance. Yeah. Select for update. Yeah. Good, good idea. Okay. So, so we're we're already getting into the solution. So, um, wrapping in the transaction first of all, and then beginning with the select for update. So my question would be, what? Do we want to select for update, and what might be a good thing in this case? I appreciate you don't even know the application, <laughs> but I can make an assumption about it. The balance, uh, select for update, because that's all I got to change. The balance, okay, so that's or a good that. idea. What if I were to say that the balance is not something that's overwritten, it's just lots of records, so each time you add like a credit or a debit, and then you keep the running total, would that work? <coughs> Uh, but then well, what row in, the, in that balance table would you select for update? Maybe the last one. You need the last one? You need that might work. I actually haven't thought about it. <laughs> um, any, other, any other ideas? Because there's lots of ways to do this. That's all the schema you have. Yeah, because if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're demoralizing your data, if you're showing well, of course it does, yes. I mean, this, this software doesn't even exist. So. <laughs> we can make up what it does. Um, well, conceptually, what are we trying to stop? What do we actually want to stop happening at once? It's probably the account row. The, the account? The, yeah. Great. So you could do it on the row as the account. It's quite like heavy duty, but that would be the simplest way to do it. So here's an example. Um, so let's say we've got a row, which is the account that you don't want someone to draw two things at once from concurrently. So, worker one selects for update on the account. It doesn't even use this table, otherwise. But it gets writes on that account at that point. Then, worker two comes along, tries to do the same thing, but can't. Worker one checks the balance on maybe another table, uh, reduces the balance, great, then it commits. As soon as this happens, worker two's turn. And now it, it gets the lock on it, nothing else will do it, it's, got, it's its turn, we'll check the balance, and it's, uh, there's not enough money, and it will raise the exception, insufficient funds. So, oh, I'm going to show you how to do it in a minute. <laughs> Any questions? Actually, no, I'll, I'll save questions till the end. So, uh, this, is, this is essentially the solution uh, from a database perspective. So, the way we implement that in Django, and this is the Django slide, I think... I'm not sure if you can be able to read this, so I'll have to just explain. Um, so you have to do two things. Uh, it's, it's what Harry said. The first thing is to wrap it in a context manager called transaction.tommy. So the Django is a way that Django allows you to wrap your, uh, your queries in atomic transactions. 
It's really good and actually somewhat complex, potentially. Um, I encourage you to do more research into that. Um, but you can just sort of safely use it as a context manager and have, have anything else, even deep down in your call, will, will be wrapped. The second thing you need to do is use select for update, which is just uh, a method on a query set or a manager. And so what we're doing here is doing internal account dot objects dot select for update dot get and then it's getting the ID of that account. And then once you've done that, that will then wait, as we saw here, that's enough for that particular process to be protected from concurrency with itself and it will go and do its thing. The select for update applies just to that internal account ID. Yes. So just think of it as it's only applying to a single row yeah. or a single record. So it doesn't have like a it doesn't have like a global like if you're not doing this somewhere else and you need to, it won't protect that. So it will protect the the get in order to get of get the single record. Or a or a filter. So you can say probably on multiple rows. Yes. <coughs> um, if we have time, I will cover that in the bonus, <coughs> bonus section. <laughs> I might have time. Um, do you need to have the query set executes in order to get the lock to apply? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, why don't we, why don't we do this in the, the <laughs> questions? Because basically, that's the end. It's really happening. Darren, Darren, wait. Um, so this is a summary. Database concurrency is something you need to think about. There are, there are actually lots of ways to approach this. The approach I've just shown you is called pessimistic locking. You can have optimistic locking. You could put your database into serializable mode. I think that would work. Um, but like, it's about finding the right tool for the context. Um, and I'm still learning about this as well, to be honest. Um, second point, make sure you know what isolation level your database is in and how concurrent reading and writing work in that isolation level. Um, next, select for update makes a read query behave like a write query. <coughs> and fourth, pessimistic locking is a simple way to make your code wait until it's safe to do so. So, any questions? Good question. So um, I have a few pitfalls here. So this is pitfall three <laughs> testing. Um, Django's default test case wraps all your stuff in the transaction. So you can have a situation where you might, in error, have a select for update, which isn't wrapped in the transaction, and it will pass the unit test. Uh, it's really annoying. So um, and you'll only find out in production unless you're doing some other tests. Um, so transaction test case is a bit of a confusingly named test case, which doesn't wrap into transactions. <laughs> and it does a full database truncase thing. So, um, so you can test transactional stuff using this one. It's a bit lower level. So. Yes. Uh, can you speak to the uh, performance impacts of select for update for the database? So my understanding is, is it blocks. Like, and you can actually, like it could block for seconds. I mean, um, a really nice exercise is to open up two manager.py shells and then you can turn off auto committing using transaction.set auto commit false and then you can run queries within an uncommitted transaction on both terminals. They'll, open, they'll have their own sessions and you can see how it behaves. So if you were to do um, a select for update in one of them and then try and do a select for update in the other one, You'll see, it will, you'll hit enter and you'll just wait. And then you do transaction.commit and then your other, uh, your other session gets uh, open. I really recommend that as an exercise to get the head around. <coughs> yes? Can you make Django do a, a transaction per request? Yes, good question. So there is um, a setting called atomic requests. You just set it to true. Um, it's, I think it's quite a good idea to have that on, actually. What that means is if there's an exception raised at any point in the request response cycle, yeah. it will roll the database back. Yeah. I think one last question. Sure. Uh, Adam. What happens if I select for update and there's nothing there? Do I still get a lock? So it's like a read query, so I wouldn't think so. Um, I mean, you're, if you're, if you're, you just, it's a good question, no. but I, I would say no. Because what would you be locking? Yeah. 
If you're filtering, as Harry suggested, filters are lazy. So there's a danger of doing a select that doesn't actually happen. Um, so is it not all, by the way? Yeah, exactly. Anything like that. The only one that isn't is get. But uh, ask me afterwards if you want to know how to do it. Cool. Okay. Thank you.